Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see a huge turnout for this event. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker here today, uh, Dr. Fanson, who grew up in Wisconsin, where the dark nighttime sky spurred an interest in astronomy and space exploration. For more than 30 years, he has been engaged in the development of telescopes to explore the heavens. After receiving his PhD in applied mechanics from Caltech, he joined NASA's JPL. He was a member of the team that repaired the Hubble Space Telescope and served as observatory manager of the Spitzer Space Telescope, Hubble's infrared companion. He was project manager of the Galaxy Evolution Explorer and the Kepler Exoplanet Mission. Currently, he is employed by GMTO Corporation as project manager for the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is what he's here to talk about today. So please give a warm welcome to our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Can everybody hear me? Very good. Hopefully people in the back can hear me. Um, I'd like to um, express my um, uh, honor and uh, privilege to speak to you today. Uh, Caltech is my home, and um, it's very gratifying to see so many of my colleagues and friends um, in the audience here tonight. Uh, Dr. Brickenridge, Dr. Stone, David writes us here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to speak to you about the Giant Magellan Telescope, uh, and I've got a lot of material to cover, uh, so I'm going to get right underway. I've uh, borrowed material uh, from several people that I'd like to recognize, um, including uh, Pat McCarthy, who's the director, and Rebecca Bernstein, also a Caltech alum who is the uh, project scientist for GMT, uh, the Keras Mirror Lab at the University of Arizona, where the mirrors for our telescope are manufactured. Um, Aram Mika, who is a past Lockheed Martin Vice President at the Advanced Technology Center in Palo Alto. And uh, the four uh, that I consider the legacy designers of the Giant Magellan Telescope, uh, Steve Sheckman, Steve Gunnels, Charlie Hall, and Matt Johns. The Giant Magellan Telescope is a collaboration of about a dozen universities and scientific institutions across the globe uh, we are funded by these institutions. Uh, we receive no direct <laughs> government money, uh, and so these institutions... I'm sorry? Was there a question? Okay, I'll explain where Caltech fits in in a moment. <laughs> but first, um, I want to uh, talk a, a little bit about telescopes and why we care about them. <clears throat> Um, and generally, uh, what we're interested in doing is uh, studying faint objects that are far away. Uh, and that's what telescopes help us do. Telescopes collect and concentrate light uh, or focus light uh, so that we can take images or we can disperse the light and take spectra. Uh, but collecting light and focusing light is the primary objective. And for a telescope, even the type of telescope in this cartoon, uh, a telescope is fundamentally characterized by what we call the size of the aperture or the size of the collecting area, either uh, a lens at the front of a telescope or a mirror, a concave mirror that reflects and focuses light. The size of the telescope, diameter D, they typically are circular uh, apertures, uh, fundamentally uh, 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 dictates the uh, uh, ultimate performance of a telescope. So, the light collecting power of a telescope is proportional to the area of the collecting aperture, and that goes as the square of the diameter. Uh, and the resolving power, the amount of detail that you can form in an image, uh, uh, ignoring the atmosphere, I'll come back to the atmosphere in a moment, uh, is also proportional to the diameter. So just to remind you from your basic physics, um, if there's a plane wave of light uh, that passes through a circular aperture, it produces uh, an image which has a certain structure, which is shown here. And, I'm, and remember this um, pattern, because we'll come back to this a bit later. Uh, if you plot the intensity as a plot, what you see is that there's a, a peak of light in the center, and then there are ripples of concentric rings going out. This is called the airy pattern, and this is called the airy disk. And the diameter of the airy disk is related to the wavelength of light that you're looking at uh, and it's inversely proportional to the diameter of the aperture. So <clears throat> the larger the telescope, the larger the D, uh, 
the more compact or the more um, uh, uh, concentrated uh, the light is in the focal plane. So ultimately, the history of the telescope is a quest for size. Uh, telescopes is, is a, a field where size does matter. I'd like to start uh, by a discussion of the human eye, which is a telescope in a sense, although a very small one. Uh, the pupil, when it's dilated at night, is about 5 millimeters in diameter, or about 0.2 square centimeters of collecting area. And with the human eye and its sensitivity, when you look at the night sky, you can see about 6,000 stars, so-called naked eye visible stars, uh, that are in the reach of your, of your, uh, of your eye. About 300 years ago, there was a tremendous breakthrough made by Galileo. Galileo did not invent the telescope, but he was the first person uh, to point the telescope at the heavens to study objects in the sky. And his telescope was only an inch in diameter, about 2.6 centimeters, but it was a vast improvement both in collecting power and in resolution over the human eye. And he made many fundamental discoveries, including the moons of Jupiter, sunspots uh, on the sun, craters on the moon, and, and so on. By the late 19th century, uh, telescopes of the, of the same basic type as Galileo's reached their culmination in the Yerkes Observatory, which is built at uh, Williams Bay, Wisconsin for the University of Chicago. Uh, and it has a lens in the front of it that focuses light at the back through a hollow tube. Uh, and in the case of Yerkes, uh, the lens is a meter in diameter. This picture you can see perhaps from the writing was taken in 1921. You can recognize Albert Einstein there standing under the telescope. Uh, but this telescope represents about 8,100 square centimeters of collecting area. Uh, much more powerful even than Galileo's telescope. Um, by the beginning, early part of the 20th century, the same uh, entrepreneur and scientist who had built the Yerkes telescope, which was the world's largest, uh, George Ellery Hale, made his way west to California, uh, to Pasadena, in search of the ultimate site to build his solar telescope. And he pr proceeded to build a sequence of the world's largest telescopes, beginning with the 60-inch on Mount Wilson, then the 100-inch Hooker telescope on Mount Wilson. This machine, the Hooker telescope, is what Edwin Hubble used to make many of his profound discoveries about the universe. Uh, the fact that our galaxy is one of many galaxies, the fact that the universe is expanding. We're all done with this machine. And you'll notice a difference in this design. Uh, there's no lens at the front of this telescope. The Yerkes Observatory, the Yerkes Telescope with this one meter objective lens was considered the practical limit of building optics of that kind. So from that point forward, telescopes on the ground principally involve mirrors to reflect and concentrate light. And the Hooker 100 inch or two and a half meter uh, was the world's largest telescope for quite some time. That was followed in the mid 20th century by the 200 inch at Palomar, the so-called Hale Telescope, again built by George Ellery Hale or organized by him and named after him. And this was a five meter telescope and again uh, this was the world's largest telescope for decades, uh, collecting area of 195,000 square centimeters. The giant eye, I think they called it. And it wasn't until the end of the 20th century that technological breakthroughs enabled a new class of telescope in the 6 to 10 meter range. <clears throat> the largest telescope in operation today is the Grand Telescopio Canarias in the Canary Islands. It's uh, very similar in design to the Keck telescope, but slightly larger at 10.4 meters, or a collecting area of 785,000 square centimeters. So the progression in telescopes has been for size uh, in order to be able to see more clearly and more deeply and, and search at fainter and fainter objects. Technology continues to progress and we're now at a point where it's possible to envision building telescopes that are in the 30 to 40 meter aperture class. And there are today three projects underway uh, to build telescopes in this class. There is the European Extremely Large Telescope at 39 meters that the Europeans are building on a site in the, uh, in the Chilean Andes. There is the 30 meter telescope. This is where Caltech comes in and the man sitting behind, directly behind you uh, to build a 30 meter telescope planned for Mauna Kea in Hawaii. 
And there's the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is about 24 and a half meters, that's also destined for the Chilean Andes in the Southern Hemisphere. And what's interesting is that if you plot as a function of time the size of telescopes, you can see that there's generally a power law that's followed and that every 40 years, roughly, the size of telescopes doubles. And since Galileo, there have been about 10 doublings. And here you can see the Hooker telescope. This is the 2.5 meter. The Hale telescope is the 5. Keck at 10. And if you project this into the early 2020s, you can see that it's time that technology has progressed to the point where you would expect to be able to build telescopes in this size. And we plotted here the GMT in blue, the Giant Magellan Telescope. So technology really determines what can be done. I come back now to the Hale five meter telescope and the picture on the left is the casting of the primary mirror. You're looking at the back where, with all the light weighting uh, to, uh, to make the, uh, the mirror stiff but still lightweight. This was cast by the Corning uh, Glass Works um, out of a Pyrex material, a low expansion material. And you can see the photograph here of the people casting the mirror where they would bring ladle after ladle of molten glass and pour it into the mold. And it took a long time uh, to fill up this mold. This was considered the limit of what could be uh, done at that time. And again, this was done before the Second World War. And so the five meter limit was not broken for decades because the technology had not yet progressed. In the latter part of the 20th century though, uh, a number of technological breakthroughs occurred, principally computer control. So we could now envision uh, making measurements and active, uh, actively feeding back those measurements into control systems. So telescopes today typically are built on alt azimuth mounts. They're not built on polar aligned telescope mounts. And what you see on the left is a picture of the Magellan Telescope. This is a six and a half meter in Chile. And on the right is the Keck telescope at 10 meters on Mauna Kea. So the, the computer control technology shows up in different ways. On the telescope on the left, there are a large number of actuators in back of the primary mirror to push and pull on the mirror to bring the mirror surface into exactly the correct shape uh, to focus light. On the right, uh, the innovation, one of the innovations uh, by Jerry Nelson, who just passed away uh, very recently, uh, was to break the primary mirror up into individual hexagonal segments, each polished to the correct shape, but positioned independently of each other, and bring those mirrors into position so that they could behave as though they were a single continuous mirror, again by computer control. So the notion that computers could be used to control optics into the correct shape, and that you could segment the optical collecting surface into multiple pieces, these were tremendous breakthroughs. Along with that, breakthroughs in sensor technology so that we could measure the actual wave front. What was the incorrect shape that had to be corrected and feed that back in control loops? So finally now, with the era of the 30 meter class telescopes, like the Giant Magellan telescopes, we're taking all of these innovations but extending it to the next step. In the case of GMT, uh, we're going to make use of the so-called spin cast mirror technology that was um, developed at the University of Arizona uh, to manufacture large circular mirror segments and we're intending to phase those mirror segments together uh, to form a giant collecting surface, light collecting surface. So I'd like to take you on a tour of the telescope now. This is an animation uh, that I will attempt to narrate. Um, to fly you through. So this is on the summit of uh, Campanas Peak at the Las Campanas Observatory. The enclosure surrounds the telescope and protects it from the elements uh, when we're not observing. You can see the mirror covers deploying, uh, revealing the seven circular mirror segments. The mount of the telescope structure is an alt azimuth mount, so there are two orthogonal axes of rotation. You can see these um, circular C-rings for the elevation axis. And the <coughs> rotation um, around, the around the vertical axis is the 
uh, azimuth bearing. These are hydrostatic bearings that was pioneered. This technology of floating a bearing on a thin film of oil was pioneered for the Hale 5 meter telescope at Palomar. And for many years on Robinson, there was a scale working model of the telescope with a hydrostatic bearing in it. This is zooming into the area where the scientific instruments are located. Um, these instruments are both on the top platform that you see and then down below in the video. We don't show any scientific instruments, uh, but I will show you in another graphic. I mentioned that the enclosure around the telescope protects the telescope from the elements. But of course at night when you're observing, uh, all the enclosure can really do for you is create mischief. We need occasionally protection from the wind if the wind is too high while we're observing so that the vibrations are controlled. But generally we want the enclosure to be open so the air can flow through and uh, we can avoid um, atmospheric effects uh, from turbulence and distortion. So a little bit more now about the Giant Magellan Telescope design. It's an aplanatic Gregorian design. Uh, the Gregorian design uh, involves an intermediate focus between the primary mirror, which is formed by these seven segments, and the secondary mirror, which in our case is another collection of seven smaller mirror segments. Uh, there's a focus that occurs in front of the secondary mirror. So we can put calibration instrumentation and make other measurements at the focus at that location. Uh, it's designed to have a wide corrected field of view. So we have a 20 arc minute usable field of view. It's a doubly segmented design. The primary and the secondary are both uh, segmented. And this uh, creates unusual uh, technical challenges to be dealt with. And we do our adaptive optics, and I'll explain more about that in a few slides, <laughs> at the secondary mirror. So those seven secondary mirrors that are a meter in diameter um, are flexible mirrors uh, that are driven at high bandwidth. The aperture, as I said, is 24 and a half meters. It operates in the visible through the infrared. It's got a very fast primary mirror. Uh, at, um, the primary mirror is at f0.7. So this makes it interesting to polish these mirrors, uh, particularly given that the Outer six mirror segments are off-axis, uh, and for those who, for which this makes a difference uh, or has a meaning, uh, the aspheric departure on these mirrors is uh, 14 and a half millimeters. And the other interesting aspect is that we have a very efficient optical system. There are two reflections, one off the primary, one off the secondary, before entering uh, the, the direct, so-called direct Gregorian instruments. So in terms of optical throughput, the throughput is quite high. This gives you a two view of the uh, telescope. It sits on a concrete pier, which is, uh, which is typical. This is the azimuth axis in the observing floor. You can see a figure here for scale. Uh, these are, again, the C rings, which represent the, uh, the bearing for the elevation axis. Uh, and then we have the primary mirror segments, a tower, or a truss that supports the secondary mirrors. The overall height is about 48 meters. Another way to look at that height, uh, this is what we look like compared to the space shuttle in its launch configuration. Um, and the telescope on its elevation axis uh, can point at the zenith and then about this bearing uh, uh, to 25 degrees above the horizon. Another interesting aspect of this architecture of this design is that if we look straight on the telescope, right down the line of sight of the telescope, uh, the outer six primary mirror segments are completely unobscured. Uh, and this is unique. Uh, and it turns out there are interesting things that you can do when you have unobscure, an unobscured aperture. There's very little scattering, optical scattering, um, there's no break across the pupil, so in terms of doing high contrast imaging, looking for exoplanets and doing things of that nature, you have interesting opportunities with, with this design. I mentioned the high uh, optical throughput. Uh, the light comes into the telescope, strikes the primary mirror, off the secondary mirror, and then back into the back focal area. And we have a collection of instruments that we call direct Gregorian instruments. 
uh, where the light comes directly through, or we can put a fold mirror in place uh, and uh, branch off the light into a collection of what we call folded port instruments. So there's a suite of instruments that are integrated at the center of the telescope. Um, and this is another difference uh, from other telescopes that you might be uh, more familiar with, like the Keck, for example. So in those designs, there are so-called Naismith platforms, which are gravity invariant positions uh, for mounting instruments. In this case, we do um, something that's more akin to the Gemini telescopes, where we carry the instruments around integrated into the telescope. And as the telescope moves in orientation, the gravity vector swings around these instruments. An advantage of this is that it gives us the ability to choose which instrument we're using and switch between instruments depending upon observing conditions. So if the weather is um, very favorable for one type of science, we can do that observing program. If the weather deteriorates during the night, we can switch to a different instrument. That's called Q scheduling, and that allows you to squeeze more efficiency, scientific efficiency, out of the instrument, out of the telescope. These instruments are located um, in a large cylindrical assembly uh, just behind the central primary mirror segment. This is what we call the Gregorian instrument rotator. So remember, this telescope structure is an alt azimuth mount, which means that as you track objects across the sky, the image rotates. And so you have to have something to derotate the image. So in our case, all of these instruments, here's another figure for scale. This is a six by nine meter cylinder. This entire assembly rotates to do the derotation of the image as we track objects across the sky. So we have a very massive, large, third degree of freedom in the telescope. So we have the elevation axis, the azimuth axis, and the Gregorian instrument rotator. So coming back to the uh, casting of the mirrors, how do you make these uh, very large, stiff mirror segments? So I'm going to walk you through how this is done um, at the University of Arizona. So recall that the uh, five meter Palomar uh, mirror was the limit of casting technology in the mid 20th century done by the Corning Glassworks. By comparison, uh, here to the same scale is an off axis mirror segment of the Giant Magellan Telescope. And again, you're looking at the back surface, and you can see all the holes in the back. These are the light weighting cores. Um, this mirror is 85% light weighted. The Palomar mirror was made of Pyrex, which is a low expansion material. Uh, these uh, mirrors are made of borosilicate, which is a, a similar type of material. It's a low expansion material. But importantly, it's not an ultra low expansion material. So it is not like uh, ULE that you could get from Corning or like Zerodor. So this is another complication for us. Uh, the advantage of the borosilicate glass is that it can be cast in a mold. So at the University of Arizona, underneath the 55,000 seat football stadium is the mirror laboratory where this work is done. Uh, you can see a photograph here of the technicians placing chunks of E6 glass in the mold. And I'll show you a video so you can follow this process. Uh, but this is special glass that's made in Japan in small quantities in clay pots that are also made by hand. Uh, and um, the, the glass is um, manufactured, uh, fractured into pieces, put in containers, shipped to the United States, is taken out, inspected, uh, and then placed in the, in the mold uh, to manufacture uh, these mirrors. Once they are cast, they are ground and polished. Uh, in the next hall over, this is a photograph that shows one of our mirror segments on the polishing machine. Uh, they're in the process of actually drilling a small hole in the center to drain the uh, polishing uh, material as they polish. And in the back, you can see a second segment that's on the grinding machine that does the coarse grinding and coarse removal of glass. And in the center is the uh, optical test tower. So there's a tower that goes up all the way to the Wildcat Club uh, in the stadium. Uh, and it turns out because our mirrors have such a long focal length that to test them we have to fold the beam uh, to do the testing because the university would not allow the mirror lab to go any higher uh, 
because they would have broken through the floor of the Wildcat Club. So testing these mirrors uh, is also a bit of a challenge. So I'd like to run you through a video now that shows the sequence of events starting with the floor of the, of the furnace. Uh, this is the refractory material that's put in to form the mold. Here are the, the walls. It's then spun and, and heated up in order to uh, remove volatiles. Then the hexagonal refractory core elements are placed in. Then the glass elements, the chunks of E6 glass are placed in. The lid is put on. It's heated up and spun. And the glass melts and flows into the mold. And the reason that the furnace is being spun while this goes on is to create a parabolic surface on the front uh, so that the amount of material that needs to be removed is reduced. It takes uh, months to do the casting and to slowly cool uh, the mirror. Uh, lifting fixtures put on and then it's lifted out of the mold. Uh, the most recent mirror we cast is our center segment. Uh, this is, uh, we call this mirror segment number four. And you can tell it's a center segment because it has a hole in the center for the light reflected off the secondary mirrors to come down uh, into the back focal area to the science instruments. So um, I like to say the fellow on the top is looking for his contact lens, but really what's going on is they're, they're doing a visual inspection, looking for inclusions, defects, and other things that might require localized rework. I will point out that the diameter of, this, of the hole in our center segment is 2.4 meters, which is the size of the mirror that is in the Hubble Space Telescope. So in terms of the, of the difference between ground-based telescopes and telescopes you put in space, the principal difference is uh, telescopes you put in space necessarily must be smaller uh, because they have to go on the nose of a rocket. Once the mirrors are cast, uh, they are polished, ground and polished. This is showing mirror segment number two being polished uh, using a so-called stress lap. Uh, it's an active lap in an orbital motion. Uh, these off-axis mirrors are, are are, are very um, steep um, slopes and shapes to polish. So it a, was a major challenge to manufacture a mirror like this. In fact, um, these mirrors are 8.4 meters in diameter. They are the largest mirrors that are made in the world. And no one had ever attempted to do an off-axis mirror of this size until we uh, did the first mirror for GMT. So it took a long time to convince ourselves that this was possible. Uh, the testing of the mirror lab uh, involves three independent optical measurements uh, to verify that the shape is correct so that we don't suffer the same fate as the Hubble Space Telescope. <coughs> the current status of our mirrors, the first mirror is complete uh, and is in storage in Tucson. Uh, we're polishing the front surface of mirror two. Uh, we're uh, doing rear surface generating on mirror three. Um, mirror four is undergoing rear surface polishing and we're preparing the mold uh, to cast mirror segment five. Uh, we have all the glass on hand for mirror segment six and we have a half order, the first half order of glass for mirror segment seven is expected to be delivered in the next few weeks uh, and then this fall we'll order the second uh, installment of glass for segment seven. The segments are supported in mirror cells uh, and here's a, a, a picture. The blue is, is the glass and the gray is the cell. Uh, the glass at this stage, once it's polished, weighs about 17 tons. Uh, the steel in the cell is about 23 tons. The point-to-point -point dimension is about 10 meters. And interesting, uh, the design of this telescope uh, uses the cell weldments as part of the telescope structure. So once these cells are, are bolted in place, it forms part of a monocoque structure for the overall telescope. And at 3.2 meters high, it's actually possible uh, to stand up and walk around inside the mirror cell. Uh, and when you reach up, above you are all of the mirror control actuators and temperature control hardware. Uh, so it'll be interesting uh, to actually uh, do a tour inside the mirror cell. The operations concept for the telescope requires that all of the off-axis mirror cells and segments be interchangeable. Uh, the plan is to have a seventh off-axis mirror and mirror cell so that we can always exchange one of them 
uh, and take one off the telescope for recoding to keep the reflective surface fresh and high performance. So this shows a crane lifting off one of the off-axis segments. It drops down through um, uh, an aperture in, in the floor and then down over to the coating chamber where a freshly coated mirror would then uh, reverse this journey and be uh, bolted into the telescope during a day shift operation. The mirrors are supported on 165 pneumatic force actuators which uh, are connected to load, what we call load spreaders. Uh, most of them are triangular, some of them are square. So this is a cross section of the pneumatic actuator single axis version we have single axis and three axis configurations. And then attached to the load spreader are pucks that are bonded to the back surface of the mirror. So the mirror, if you will, sits on a bed of nails. Only these nails are actuators where we can precisely control the amount of force that's placed on the mirror. So we can lift the mirror, move it in rigid body, but we can also bend the mirror in order to uh, place the mirror into the correct uh, ellipsoidal shape uh, for the telescope. This, um, these actuators are controlled at low bandwidth at a fraction of a hertz. So uh, this is what we call active optics. So this was one of the breakthroughs that I mentioned earlier uh, that allowed uh, telescopes like the Subaru, like the Gemini telescopes, like the Magellan telescopes, uh, the new technology telescope that the Europeans built at La Silla. To trace the load path of the telescope, this is a cross section again that shows uh, the force actuator up through the um, load spreader and through the puck attached to the glass. That's, this, that's the configuration that we're in when we're in operations and we're controlling and positioning the mirrors. When there's an earthquake, the force actuators are quickly overcome by the inertial force of the motion of the mirrors. And in that case, the connection through the load spreader uh, passes down into an area that we call the static support. And here's a photograph of a static support of the type used on the Gemini telescope. I'm sorry, of the Magellan telescope. <clears throat> and there's a clearance both lateral and axial of several millimeters. So when the, when the inertial force of the earthquake wants to throw the mirror uh, relative to the mirror cell, it's caught by these static supports, which you can see are wire rope configurations. They're basically giant damped springs. So to protect the telescope in a seismic event, we have a large number of these so-called static supports. But it turns out on a telescope this size, that is not enough to protect the glass. I remind you that Chile is a very seismically active area. Uh, this is a map that shows in this red dot the location of our site at Las Campanas. Uh, the west coast of South America is much like the west coast of North America. There's a subduction zone of the Pacific plate going under the continental plate. Uh, and earthquakes are frequent. In fact, um, down here in 1960, this is a magnitude 9.5 earthquake. This is the largest magnitude earthquake ever measured on the surface of the Earth. Uh, and you can see that there have been earthquakes close to our site as recently as 2015. Here's an 8.3. So when you do the uh, so-called site-specific seismic hazard analysis, and there are people that do this for a living, uh, you can estimate that the frequency of an earthquake of magnitude 8.5 or higher in our area of Chile, uh, the return period is about... 300 years, and we're building our observatory with a 50-year service life. Uh, so the, there, there is a finite, reasonably likely chance of a major earthquake. So to deal with this seismic environment, we're doing something that no one has done before on an optical telescope. We are incorporating seismic isolators into the concrete ring wall of our uh, concrete pier uh, in order to allow relative motion of the ground to the telescope in the event of a massive seismic um, event. So this is a cross section showing the telescope on the pier. This is the cylindrical pier ring wall. And at this station around the perimeter, there are 24 
so-called single friction pendulum devices. Here's a photograph of what these look like next to a human being. These are now fairly common devices for isolating buildings, bridges, and offshore oil platforms, uh, civil engineering structures. <coughs> Excuse me. They have never before been used on a precision device such as a telescope. So the first thing that you have to worry about is when we are doing operations and observing the heavens, we need not to disrupt or compromise the boundary condition, the rigidity and the stability, the boundary condition of the telescope by putting them on these isolators. These particular isolators allow plus or minus a half a meter of relative motion. So after an earthquake, they're gonna be in some uh, random location. So we have to have the ability to recenter the entire telescope and peer um, over the center of these isolators. So it, it's something that we take seriously and, and is, um, uh, is not a trivial undertaking. I should say that the other two 30 meter class telescopes, the TMT and the ELT, are also incorporating some form of seismic isolation into their designs. Uh, and this is principally due to the fact that with a telescope this size, there's enough structural amplification of ground motion that you get sizable displacements and accelerations up at the telescope optics. Now, I want to switch back and talk about achieving the ultimate resolving power of a telescope of this size, and specifically the Giant Magellan Telescope. So what I've depicted here is a, a, a view of a very small portion of the sky. Uh, it's 10, um, uh, I don't know why it says 10 dash 30 arc seconds. Um, but this is a, a very small area of high magnification showing what a collection of stars would look like at two microns wavelength in the K-band uh, due to the effect of atmospheric seeing. So this is the best imaging you're going to do from the ground uh, if you are looking through the atmosphere and you don't do anything to correct the atmosphere. So about 0.6 arc seconds is the best resolution you can get. If you go above the atmosphere to space, <coughs> This is an image from the NICMOS. This is from the Hubble Space Telescope, again with an aperture of 2.4 meters. And you can see now we're getting better spatial resolution because the size of the telescope is increasing and there's no atmosphere in space. With the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope, which is a six and a half meter telescope, uh, again, it'll have a diffraction limit of about 0.07 arc seconds and produce images of this kind. With a 24 and a half meter aperture, or a 25 meter aperture, this is theoretically what you would be able to achieve um, from the ground if you can defeat the atmosphere and you can properly phase the telescope. So there are enormous opportunities scientifically uh, for exploration as you, might, as you might well imagine. So how do we achieve this on the GMT? <clears throat> the first thing that we need to do is align the telescope uh, optical elements. We've got seven primary mirror segments. We've got seven secondary mirror segments. We have uh, instruments that, that have to be in alignment. Uh, so the way we're going to approach this, uh, which will be familiar, I think, to uh, the JPL people in the audience, we're going to have an optical truss of absolute laser uh, uh, ranging um, uh, distance uh, met metrology uh, lasers in an optical truss that will allow us to rapidly align the optical system to a known reference uh, coordinate system to the telescope. And this should allow us to get the optics aligned to about seven microns RMS, which is in the capture range <coughs> of our phasing camera uh, to align the segments. So to align the segments, we measure across the edges of the adjacent segments uh, we take light from regions that are separated by about 20 centimeters. So these are large gaps between these circular segments. So this is different than on the Keck telescope or on TMT. Um, and we use what's called a uh, uh, dispersed fringe sensor uh, that basically forms a two-slit interference pattern that's dispersed by wavelength in the vertical axis. And as the piston changes, uh, between the two sides of the measurement, uh, the fringe pattern 
tilts in this dispersed fringe measurement. And the angle of the tilt tells us what the, what the phase difference is in piston between the two segments. Now, because our segments are made of uh, a Pyrex-like material rather than a zero expansion material, and because our segments are so large, uh, it's, it's, we can't simply phase the primary mirror segments and then use measurements at the edge to keep them phased uh, for long periods of time. We have to continually estimate the phasing of the segments and correct them. So our phasing camera uh, provides updates every 30 seconds. And then we rely on edge sensors uh, between the segments uh, to maintain their position um, in between those 30 second measurements. If we're looking at a very bright star, a very bright target, if we're doing, doing exoplanet work, for example, um, then we can have very high bandwidth phase measurements made by a pyramid sensor. Uh, but if we're looking at an area where there are no bright guide stars, then it's a, a challenge to do this phasing. So this is an area where we're spending a lot of engineering effort uh, to resolve how we're going to keep the telescope phased. Once the telescope is phased, now you've got a 30 meter class telescope, but you still have the problem of looking through the atmosphere. So just to remind you, the atmosphere <coughs> is, um, is full of what we call uh, thermal cells on the order of 20 to 40 centimeters in size. So these cells are at different temperatures throughout the atmosphere. And when they have different temperature and pressure, they have a different refractive index. And that bends the light in a different way. Or to think about it alternatively, there's a plane wave of light coming from objects in infinity that strike the Earth's atmosphere. And as they pass through the atmosphere, those plane waves get distorted into funny shapes. And you can see the effect of this easily when you look over a paved road and there are heated elements of the air. You get these uh, mirage effects. It's the same thing going on. And this is what causes stars to twinkle when you look at them at night with the naked eye. It's the zigging and zagging of the light as it comes through these different, uh, different uh, thermal cells. So by the time the light reaches your focal plane, it, it's not planar anymore. It's got an irregular shape. And moreover, that shape is changing millisecond by millisecond. So what you need to do is have a system that we call adaptive optics that allows you to measure the wavefront <clears throat> and correct it. So this is a photograph of what a star would look like in a giant telescope or any telescope of any size coming through the atmosphere. These individual cells of different temperature and density form little images that are moving around. We call these speckles. And so what we need to do is have a wavefront sensor uh, and and through that wavefront measurement, send commands to actuators on a deformable mirror that will compensate the shape of that mirror or, or bend that mirror to compensate for the distorted wavefront such that the reflected wavefront is restored. And that allows you to get back to what looks like an airy image from what I showed you early on um, in the slide deck, the theoretical uh, looking <coughs> image pattern you would get if there were no atmosphere. So we have such systems um, on all modern telescopes, and we will have such a system on GMT. What's different about GMT than most telescopes is that our deformable mirrors, rather than being buried down behind the primary mirror with the scientific instruments, our, um, our deformable mirrors are the secondary mirrors up on the top of the tower at the front of the telescope. So these are the seven one meter um, uh, secondary mirrors, and they each contain 672 actuators, which are magnetic actuators. So the, the, in, a, in its powered off configuration, a two millimeter thick face sheet of zero door or glass is, is held fixed to uh, magnetic detents on the actuators. When we energize the mirrors, we push the, the the thin face sheet off of the actuators and it floats in a magnetic field. And then we can command the magnetic field and we can bend this two millimeter thick face sheet into whatever shape we need to correct the wavefront at that instant. So these mirrors will operate at a two kilohertz bandwidth. 
and millisecond by millisecond, we will correct the wave front um, that is distorted by the atmosphere. So with all of these seven um, adapted secondary mirrors, we'll have 4,704 actuators across the entire aperture. I want to come back now to the enclosure. I'm trying to touch upon all of the engineering challenges that we have. I mentioned that the ideal enclosure around a telescope is one that protects you during the day from the elements, but disappears at night, so it doesn't interfere with the airflow. Occasionally, when, when the wind is high, you want some protection from the wind. So ideally, we would like an enclosure that looks like this. Here's the telescope, and here's the windscreen, and it's built in two uh, rotating halves that we can uh, move in front or away from the telescope line of sight. Uh, but then there would be nothing to interfere with the airflow. But unfortunately, that's not a practical structure to build. We can't make the upper part of the enclosure vanish at night. Uh, so what we do is analyze uh, how to minimize the impact of the enclosure on the image quality uh, due to the air that's flowing across the ground, up into the enclosure, any elements in the enclosure that are releasing heat or absorbing heat that would cause uh, different temperatures to form uh, inside the air in the enclosure that the telescope has to view through. Uh, so we have our own internal computational fluid dynamics capability. We've also hired the Boeing company, and they're experts at airflow, um, to do analysis for us. This is an image from Boeing. Uh, and we're now finalizing the design of the enclosure uh, to give us the best possible image quality. So the Magellan telescopes at Las Campanas um, are famous for the image quality that they deliver, uh, among the best in the world, and we want to be careful not to compromise the best image quality at this site in the Chilean Andes. This is a rendering of what the observatory will look like on our summit. Uh, we have various other buildings for uh, uh, working on the primary and secondary mirrors, the scientific instruments. Uh, we've built two 50 meter uh, meteorological towers to characterize the ground layer airflow over the summit to get an idea of what the turbulence profile looks like above the ground. Um, and to measure other aspects of uh, wind uh, direction. Uh, there's a very prevalent wind, dominant wind direction um, at this site, so we know um, most of the time the direction the wind will be coming from. This is the current state of our site. Uh, the summit was uh, flattened about 13 meters of the mountain, uh, was removed to create a flat mesa for the observatory, and then roads were put in. Uh, we have two what we call support sites. This is the support site that involves um, a dormitory that can house a construction crew of 250 individuals, a dining facility, recreation facility, a second set of uh, dormitory uh, rooms for our own people. Um, up at this site, not yet constructed, will be the factory for working on the primary and secondary mirrors, storage, backup generators, and, and uh, uh, other workshops. And then at the very summit, we've located construction offices. This is a picture from a drone video that shows the summit. Here are the two 50-meter meteorological towers, our construction offices on the summit. And you can barely see in the background there are some concentric circles at this end of the mesa uh, to where the telescope will be built. You'll note that there's enough room for two 30-meter telescopes, so there are those including Roger Angel that wants to build a second one and then link them together as an optical interferometer. <clears throat> Maybe one day. In terms of the schedule, um, these are earliest dates. This depends upon everything going right and uh, funding coming in when it's expected. Uh, our plan is to go on the sky with four of the seven primary mirror segments in a first light engineering exercise in 2023 with construction completed in 2026. Here are some of the um, key milestones that are coming up. Uh, we've been evaluating proposals from industry for the telescope structure. Uh, one thing that's different about our collaboration is that our partners provide cash to the GMTO Corporation uh, and then we do global competition for contracts based on best value to GMTO. Uh, and we're evaluating now international uh, proposals uh, 
uh, for building the telescope structure. Uh, we expect uh, to award contracts for the telescope mount uh, next month, uh, and then bid packages for the first of the enclosure uh, work packages. We plan to start concrete work uh, late this year or early next year and have the enclosure closed to weather in mid-2020 to receive the telescope structure, which needs to be erected and tested in a controlled environment, or at least a protected environment. Um, and I won't go through the balance of these in the interest of time. But for those of you who are perhaps students or interested uh, in management, I thought I would end uh, by talking about <clears throat> five things that you need to do project management. Um, I worked for 30 years at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and I was trained uh, in project management by some uh, uh, very uh, accomplished managers. And I was, I was taught that you need five things uh, to manage a project. You need a work breakdown structure. This is the organizing framework for everything in the project. Um, every bucket of work that needs to be done gets a unique number in a hierarchical structure. You need an organization structure uh, that needs to uh, be mapped into the work breakdown structure. And you need to be clear about roles, responsibilities, accountability, and authority of every individual and every institution that's involved in the enterprise. You need to have requirements, <clears throat> which is another way of saying you need a systems engineering process. And by that, that I mean to include you need requirements flow down, you need technical budgets, you need the underlying analysis and simulation capability, you need to understand and control interfaces, and you need to understand your concept of operations. You need a schedule. The best form of schedule is a network logic schedule with receivable deliverable tie points so that everybody understands what they need to deliver, when they need to deliver it, and to whom they need to deliver it uh, so that you can keep things moving on schedule. And then finally, you need a budget. And by that, what I really mean is you need a system of project controls. You need to understand how much money is allocated you need to understand the basis of the estimate for that amount of money. You need to be keeping track of what the cost is at completion. So as you make changes or have problems or need to re release reserves, need to change scope, need to invoke a descope, you understand what that means in terms of the budget at complete and the schedule at complete, and you need to have a change control process. But underlying all of these things are the people that are involved in the enterprise. And there, you need to pay attention to a professional culture, a professional work environment. And I borrowed these uh, from Aram Mika, uh, from Lockheed Martin. He's since uh, passed away in, in 2005. Um, but I'll read these to you because I think these are good things to take away with you. His 11 guidelines for leadership are to practice, first of all, practice a single standard of courtesy. Number two, focus on making your team and your people vibrantly successful. You can't succeed unless they succeed. Never attribute to malice that which can be explained by ignorance or happenstance. It's a basic human trait to try to attribute motives to other people. And research shows that 95% of the time we're wrong about people's motives. You need not compromise civility to be Effective. This is something I think they should pay more attention to in Washington, D.C. these days. <laughs> Stay on the high road. Don't go down in the mud when things are getting ugly. Treat every job as if you'll be there for the rest of your life. Take what you do very seriously. Embrace the requisites for senior leadership. This is one that eludes many people. This means that you've got to recognize that there's a reason for upper management and they know things you don't know and they make decisions that may not make sense to you, but you've got to recognize the need for this in any organization. Shamelessly assimilate outstanding traits of others. I think that speaks for itself. Think of your job in terms of three numbers, the percent of time ecstatic, 
the percent of time satisfied and the percent of time disgusted. <laughs> and make your decisions accordingly. Discard the woulda, coulda, shoulda. There's no point in, in assessing blame. And finally, enjoy humanity. We're all human beings. We live in a human system. <coughs> we need a village to get things like this accomplished. So that ends my uh, prepared presentation. I'd like to point you to our website or our social media if you'd like to follow us. Um, and uh, I'll be happy to take any of your questions for the time that remains to us, Michelle. Great.